journalist and author Douglas Murray. Shalom. Shalom. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you for coming to our studio here in Jerusalem. Yesterday, you received an award of appreciation from the President of Israel, mm. from Minister of Diaspora. First of all, a few feelings after receiving this award? I was deeply moved and honored. Uh, Minister Chickley and uh, the President asked if I would come to Jerusalem to accept this award, and it was, uh, I was enormously touched. I mean, I, I'm just a writer and a journalist and say what I see, and um, you, know, you don't do it for awards or anything. You know, you just do it because that's my job as I see it. Um, but it was enormously moving to be honored for uh, my work. And um, you know, it, was, it, was a, it was a very moving occasion for me. And uh, many friends and friends of mine from Israel who I've known for many years were with me in the audience. And uh, it was, it was a, a wonderful occasion. Yeah. Now, you came to Israel very soon after October 7th. In the beginning, did you understand that you would become a, a soldier of Hasbara, or you came to be here and, and, and see from up close? Well, I don't, I don't see myself like that. I mean, I just, um, as a writer and as a journalist, I think it's very important to see things with your own eyes. And uh, that's always been my policy as a writer, that, that you, you have to see things. You, you know, many people... <laughs> sit in uh, chairs on the opposite side of the planet and comment on things. I don't, I don't think that's right. Um, you can only see the truth uh, if you actually see it with your own eyes, speak to people, witness, and report back. And that, that's all I've tried to do. And um, I'm very moved by the reception I've had around the world, but not least in Israel. Um, and I suppose I intuited early on in this conflict in the immediate aftermath of the 7th, that a lot of Jews, uh, as well as Israelis, uh, I think already felt rather alone. Uh, I'm not Jewish myself, but um, that, that already deeply worried and saddened me. Um, it shouldn't be the case that uh, a country is attacked and is then made to feel like it's uh, not got sympathy or empathy from the world. And I suppose since I've covered a lot of conflicts involving this country and other conflicts around the world, but the first conflict I covered here was in 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose I already sort of guessed this might be the case. Uh, and I guessed early on that, correctly as it turned out, that the world would spend very little time concentrating on the 7th and would immediately move on. Right, because at the beginning, you know, it, of course, Biden and of, many leaders from around the world, it felt like there was a giant embrace yeah. from all the worlds to Israel. But you said that even then you felt that, you, you understood that it will go away Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was in New York on the 7th of October and the next day went down to a demonstration in Times Square at which there were people celebrating the massacre in the heart of Times Square in New York. Uh, that was an early warning to me, I thought. Then I thought, ah, I've got to get there as soon as I can because I thought, ah, they'll move on. They'll immediately move on to Israel's response. Soon we'll get proportionality as an argument. Soon we'll get all of the usual things that come to Israel and are used against Israel whenever Israel defends itself. And I think it's monstrously unfair the way that Israel is always portrayed in the international media, or much of the international media. And, um, and monstrous the way in which people who, exp who do express sympathy and empathy for Israel after an atrocity like the 7th of October, then um, sort of have their sympathy for a bit, and then transfer their sympathy elsewhere. Uh, I find that um, deeply dishonest and worrying. I mean, the year before... Anti is it anti-Semitic? Of course, some of it's deeply anti-Semitic. The year before I was here, I was in Ukraine uh, with the Ukrainian armed forces as they were pushing back Vladimir Putin's uh, armies. And nobody, when I returned from Ukraine, said things like, you know, are you sure that the Ukrainian army are acting in an entirely proportionate fashion? Nobody was concerned about Russian casualties. Uh, nobody was concerned about you trying to stop Ukraine winning. In fact, every Western leader gets a sort of testosterone boost, it seems, whenever they discuss Ukraine. They, they always, to the end, to the end, absolutely will them on. But with Israel, it's never like that. 
And uh, I think there's a lot of questions about why. But I said at the very beginning of this conflict, and I, I, I stick to it, that uh, Israel has to be allowed to win. And I said at the beginning, this will be the case that Israel will be allowed to win a bit. But the people who say, yes, you know, you can respond to the atrocity of the seventh will fall away. And that's what we've seen. I think it's lamentable. Even the United States of America, mm -hmm. Biden with his declaration to Iran, to Hezbollah, to the Arab world, don't now, for some time already, he's saying to Israel, don't. Yeah, I mean, th there's lots of explanations for that. I mean, first of all, Biden has been better, in my view, the Americans have been slightly better, the Democrats have been slightly better than some people might have expected. That's not to make a partisan point, it's just that there's more pressure from an anti-Israel direction within the Democrat Party than there is within the Republican Party in America, although the Republican Party certainly has its own problems in this area uh, as well these days. But uh, yes, I mean, broadly speaking, I think Biden has been relatively supportive. Even when he has said things that are critical, he has continued arms supplies, for instance. However, in recent weeks, I'd say, as the IDF has been more and more successful in ridding Gaza of Hamas, uh, yeah, of course, the, the narrative has changed. As I say, I, I, I think that was totally predictable. It's always like this. I, I don't need to tell your audience. It's always like this. Exactly. Now, now I'll go back to the media because, as you mentioned, you said you knew what would happen. Hmm. So. Sometimes you ask yourself if it's worth the time. You know, you go on the news channels around the world and you try to present the truth, but you see the other side, they don't want to understand, they're ignorant. Mm. Do you feel that you can make an influence or it's basically to the audience? I mean, I, I think I would do what I do even if I didn't think I was making a difference. <laughs> but as it happens, I, I, I think I am. Uh, my belief has always been that one truth can puncture a thousand lies. Obviously, in the age of social media, that theory is being put to the test in real time. But I do believe it. And um, I believe that even, you know, when I speak to very hostile media, um, if you can show up what they don't know, for instance, if you can just show up how ignorant most of these journalists are, most of my interviewers are, are wildly ignorant about the situation. Uh, I had one the other week in South Africa who s seemed to think that she was an expert on this region and turned out she'd lived in Doha for a while whilst working for Al Jazeera. But even on a clear day, you can't see Gaza from Doha. But, uh, you know, you discover these people, um, they have an agenda. That's the real truth. A lot of the media has an agenda. Now, I mean, in a way, that's their right. You know, I mean, I'd like Israel to win this conflict. Some of them would like Hamas to win. Okay. Some of them, however, would uh, just like Israel to lose but want to hide the fact a little. They, they talk about issues in this conflict. I mean, look at the world's intense focus on Rafa in recent weeks. Every day, uh, front pages of all the newspapers, Rafa, Rafa, Rafa. Uh, none of these newspapers covered the far, far greater death toll that's been going on for the last decade in Yemen, in Syria, in many other countries and conflicts around the world. Why are they so obsessed with this one? Uh, it's a, a question underneath a question. Right, it's their opportunity to hold on to something that gives a feeling of humanitarian issue, of crisis. Well, I think one thing is, of course, they also Matt, they betray the fact that they've got the firefighter and the fire starter the wrong way around mm -hmm. in this conflict. It, 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 it's continually the case. I made the Ukraine comparison earlier, but sometimes when I, when I make that comparison in front of audience and others, I, I can sense the, 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 the pushback, which is, ah, but, but it's uh, the Russians that are the aggressor there. I go, well, first of all, who do you think the aggressor was on the 7th? But then people go, oh, well, you have to go back. You, you, know, do, you know, history didn't start on the 7th of October, they quite often say. I say yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Even the Director General of the United Nations <laughs> Absolutely. made his comment. And, um, you know, only a couple of days after the 7th of October, Secretary Blinken was talking about the importance of the two-state solution as a result for this. So a lot of people have um, come to this with a lot of existing baggage, shall we say. I mean, nobody, just, just to turn quickly to that Ukraine comparison, 
nobody has any interest when Vladimir Putin says, now look, we've got to start in the year 800. But here, everyone's keen to do that. No, 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 it's, we've got to start before, no, 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 we've got to start earlier. Okay, let's start in 2000 BC. So, so I asked you if, you if you feel that there's any influences, do you have cases where even the interviewers said to you, you know what, you have a point? Yes, yes I have. It happened very, in very early on in this conflict, actually. I was doing a, uh, an interview with Piers Morgan uh, in London from the Gaza border, and uh, we were discussing, among other things, the uh, protests that have been going on in London mm -hmm. against Israel, which is what they have been, um, that were going on every week, and uh, they'd already started. And uh, Piers is a fine journalist, uh, and he you know, is the sort of person who is open-minded, you know. And uh, he said, well, you, know, you can't just dismiss all the people at these marches as anti-Israel. I said, no, I do. I think that's what they are. And um, he said, well, you, you, know, you just sort of pushed on it. And I said, look, if you went for a march one week and even some people on it were calling for the murder of all black people, would you go on week two? And if they were doing it still on week two, might you drop out by week three? And he said, yeah, no, I would. Yeah, same thing. Now, in terms of uh, the humanitarian aid, you know, that's another issue that the world has to understand what Israel is doing. First of all, what is your opinion? Is it, do you feel that it's right that Israel is giving so much aid at this point with our hostages still there? Well, it's a very uncommon situation, isn't it, in the history of warfare for a, uh, a, a one side to be fighting and also nourishing their opponents. Um, I think it's an extraordinary testament to this country that, 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 that it does that, but it's highly unusual. I can think of uh, no other conflicts, actually, that I've covered or seen or read about in which that's the case. Um, there seems to be a, uh, I mean, a perception that Hamas is allowed to start a war and then when it loses a bit uh, is allowed to say, let's pretend we didn't start it. Again, I know of no law of war that allows that. The humanitarian aid situation is a very, very big problem. I mean, because, of course, as everyone knows, uh, Hamas uh, enjoys Palestinian casualties as much as it relishes Israeli casualties. It, again, it's, a, it's an uncommon situation in war for one side to, to not only want the murder and death of its enemies, but to also wish that its enemies will kill its own people. Well, of course, that's because Hamas is a death cult, like ISIS or mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda. Um, but that means that the laws of war are different. But it's very peculiar that the situation that Israel is forced into, where it has to fight this very uncommon enemy, and yet is also expected to supply them and much more. Uh, there's no doubting the uh, uh, appalling suffering of many of the citizens in Gaza. Um, but th that's what happens if, if you start a war. And we mentioned the hostages. Does at least that issue touch people's hearts? Yes, although I think that, again, you, I, I predicted this from the beginning, that it would slip away. We'd get into that absurd and obscene tally that is always done mm -hmm. in, any, in any conflict involving Israel, where, you know, if, if a thousand Israelis are killed, the world would sort of allow Israel to kill a thousand Hamas. Um, Anything beyond that, not allowed. Again, that, that's not how the British Army operates. That's not how the American Army operate. Um, and we've not had in any recent conflicts, I think in any conflicts, the American or British armed forces being told to stop defeating a terrorist enemy because civilian casualties are too high. Very different in Fallujah. Very different in Mosul only a few years ago. The ambition in, with Mosul was to eradicate ISIS. And that was pretty much achieved. But at what death toll? The world didn't care. With Israel, they care obsessively. And when it comes to really talking about the hostages themselves? Well, I mean, I'm horrified and amazed by the way in which the world has effectively forgotten that there are more than 100 Israelis uh, who are still held hostage in Gaza. By the way, one of the great sadnesses of that, as well as the agony of the families, one of the great sadnesses of that is that as the months have gone on, and uh, I was there at the Sheba, at the Sheba when the uh, first children were returned, and um, 
I've watched, you know, Ben Gurion Airport and elsewhere as the posters of people who have been returned come down. And of course, we're now in this situation where there are, there are of course, still women and children in captivity in Gaza. But this terrible situation where, you know, we're basically down to men. And something I've tried to stress to international audiences, among others, is, you know, there's, there's also no crime in being a man. There's no crime in being a 21-year-old young man from the Nova Party or a 74-year-old grandfather from the kibbutz. And much of the world seems to have forgotten that. And then there's the added thing, which I think is worth mentioning always, which is the obscenity of the interpretation of prisoner swaps, hostage swaps. And so there's any comparison between a Jewish child stolen from their home by Hamas from their and, bed with the pajamas. And some multiple murderer of Jews who's in an Israeli prison. And the idea that these are equals is obscene. And whenever I hear that language talked uh, abroad, I always raise it. Now we're talking here basically a lot about how to present this story to the world. Advocacy, Hasbara, it has many names. And the question is, if the state of Israel, if you feel that the state of Israel as a state officially should be much more in this battlefield as well, of presenting the truth of Hasbara, of advocacy? Well, I mean, you know, all I can do as a journalist is to tell the truth and, and report on what I see and then interpret it uh, uh, to any extent I can, try to explain uh, my understanding of the situation. Um, Israel, the Israeli state, like all states, has the right to explain its case and advocate its case. And of course, in Israel, it's slightly more complex than everywhere else because you know there are something like eight million people in this country who believe they know how to do uh, Israel advocacy. Um, I would just observe that in all of the conflicts I've seen this country involved in, uh, the situation in terms of getting information out into the world is better now than it ever has mm -hmm. been before. I mean, there are always um, exceptions, there are always mistakes made, there are always things you could do better. But in terms of actually getting information out, it's, it's, it's night and day difference over the last 20 years. It used to be incredibly, uh, there, there are incidents like uh, everything to do with this, the Shifa so-called hospital in Gaza. These things that have been argued about in the international media I reckon even 10 years ago, Israel would not have put out footage, would not have invited journalists in to go and witness for themselves the arms, munitions, dumps, and so on. Um, so I think that, it, that, that, that has to be noted. Um, but then there's always a limit to what can be done from this country because at some level it's a numbers game. You know, there are multiple countries at the United Nations who wish this country serious ill. And many of them have very powerful media. Um, mm -hmm. I think of organizations like Al Jazeera. Uh, they're able to spread a Qatari worldview around the world. And uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of influence. And uh, so I think there's a sort of limit, in a way, to the ambitions that Israel can have to persuade, I mean, you know, you're going to have a tough time persuading everyone in the region, uh, let alone the wider world. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, that, that the truth shouldn't continue to be put out there, because it should. And um, the, the job of uh, Israeli diplomacy is, is, is to do Israeli diplomacy and to uh, get out the facts as fast as possible and, and hope that they have an impact on the world. And in my observation, they very, very often do. They do. Yeah, despite I, what we're seeing, despite what we see mainly in the news outlets, it affects, it, it, they're, they're, it, it's helping. Well, you know, I mean, let's say in any Western country, let's say 10% of the public like Israel have positive mm -hmm. feelings, maybe 10% of the public have totally negative feelings and about 80% just, just want to watch the football, you know. Now, one of the successes of the Hamas and the Palestinian cause in recent years has been to try to speak to and influence that 80%. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people um, have forgotten that those majority publics are very much up for grabs. Now, those majority publics don't like the killing in Gaza. 
Well, they don't like watching it on the nightly news. Who does? Uh, but in that case, you know, those people also just have to be reminded, you know, again, who's the aggressor here? Who started this? And who are the deaths actually on? They're all on Hamas, in my view, all of them. And uh, if people realize, this has also been something I've said since the beginning of this conflict, but if they realize that the so-called calls for peace, the calls for ceasefire, each and every time set up the preconditions for the next conflict, then maybe those calls could be at least diminished a bit. My view is that most conflicts end because one side wins and one side loses. Mm -hmm. They don't stop because of an endless draw. Uh, I would like Israel to win. I'd like Hamas to lose. Other people want it the other way around, fine. I'd like to end with going back to the, to the massacre itself. As you mentioned, you came here very quickly. You visited the horrific scenes the kibbutzim, the demolished kibbutzim, the different areas. You met wounded, you met family members. You also saw the 45 minute film mm. documenting the horrific acts. There are more, even more horrific than even existed on that video, we know. Tell me please about the pictures that are still in your head, the feelings as you're, like you're out there, you know, all, mm into your activity, which is so important, but do you stop and think about the massacre itself? Oh yeah, all the time, all the time, of course. I mean, how can you not? Uh, I mean, in this country, when I'm here in Israel, um, it's, it's unavoidable. I mean, nobody in this country has moved past it, nor will they or should they for a very long time to come. Um, Maybe in the outside world, it's easier for people to forget. I don't doubt that at all. I don't forget it. I don't forget the scenes I've seen and the people I've spoken to or the bodies I've seen. Uh, they're seared into your memory. And um, as the weeks and months have gone on, um, of course, more and more people from outside of Israel who are friends of this country have come and often on missions and other things. And, there's sometimes been a certain feeling of um, concern about that, I know, from some Israelis, particularly in the South. You know, nobody wants their kibbutz to become a sort of tourist destination. And, and I understand that it's, it's a very sensitive, difficult subject, that. But I have said to people who've come through from America and Canada and elsewhere, you know, that it is very important to see uh, even see at this late stage of the, the, the ruins of some of these communities, it is important because people will have to bear witness. Mm -hmm. I said at the beginning today that, that I have this sense that it's vital to go and see things with your own eyes. And I've been constantly in the, six, the last six months reminded of this because I have come across people, as I knew I would, who claimed that what I've seen with my own eyes didn't happen. Um, there are always psychopaths out there. There are always sick people, sure. But uh, I know how wrong they are. And I know the people, it's not just those people, those are a certain type of extreme, but I also know the people who've minimized it. Mm -hmm. And I'll never let them get away with that. So is, is it important to watch the, those 45, 47 minutes? Well, that's a very difficult ethical question. Um, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's something everyone should see, uh, at all. Um, uh, I think it's important for any journalist to see. Um, maybe it's important to remind the world as often as you can of what this really means. You know, I, I've come across people in recent months who interviewed me who sort of said, you know, we know that what happened on October seventh was bad, but. Mm. So they, maybe th those people should. Th those people, I think. Let, let, don't, don't get to but quite so soon, mm -hmm. because Israel hasn't got to the but yet at all, and nor should this country. And much of the world still remains, as I expected would happen, but much of the world still remains pretty ignorant of the actual details of the horrors of what happened that day. Uh, so, you know, I, I've seen a lot of it and um, will never forget it. And uh, I suppose part of my self-appointed task is to make sure the rest of the world doesn't forget it either. 
So I just want to end with this. You mentioned how difficult and how Israel is still really in a, in a, in a time of, of mourning and a time of mm. big challenge. But you also encounter the strength, mm-hmm. the faith, mm-hmm. the courage. So mm. I'd like to end with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a good good way to end. It is important because actually, as I mentioned at the president's residence yesterday, um, since the beginning of this war, some of my regular readers and followers have said, you, you seem actually more optimistic than you usually are. <laughs> well, this interview hasn't particularly dwelt on that aspect, but um, it is actually the case. I think there's a huge place for optimism, and the optimism comes from the extraordinary young men and women this country has produced. Um, I think they're remarkable. And to see them in the field, uh, to see them from the north to the south of this country in operation uh, has been remarkable because everybody always, every generation in every country pretty much thinks, are we going to rise to our forebears? If, if the time of trial came, would we rise to the occasion? It's the question that people of my generation in Britain have, would we rise to the challenge that our grandfathers did? and the one that their fathers did. This country, that answer has, has been, has, that question has been answered. Uh, the young Israelis have risen to the moment and they are doing an incredibly difficult job. And none of the soldiers in Gaza or in the North, nobody wants to be doing this, but they're doing it not out of hatred, but out of love, out of love for their country, love for their people, and the knowledge that they are on the front line of history. And when the history books come to be written, I think that this generation is going to be written about with great, great pride. And I know because I also write the books myself. Douglas Murray, thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure.